Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Creating Teaching Materials for Fall 2020 and Beyond webinar covering authoring and adapting open educational resources for colleges and universities. My name is Meredith Jacob, and I'm a copyright lawyer at American University Washington College of Law, where I also serve as the public lead for Creative Commons USA. During this webinar today, we are going to talk about the considerations that you need to think through to set up a project for authoring open educational resources. In earlier webinars in this series, we discussed questions about relying on fair use to uh, repurpose and re-deliver existing teaching materials in the current crisis. And then we talked next about finding existing open educational resources in our last webinar, places to look for existing teaching and learning materials under an open license. And in this webinar, we're going to cover how to think through creating your own open educational resources to use in your teaching. On the next slide, I'm just going to provide a brief overview of what we mean by open educational resources. So almost all teaching and learning resources, written materials, illustrations are protected by copyright law. And open educational resources are those that are put out under an open copyright license that gives the public the ability to edit, reuse, and redistribute those conditioned on only whatever is required in the license. In this case, attribution as a basic requirement to say where you got the materials from. So these open copyright licenses allow diverse projects across universities to contribute to a pool of resources that teachers and students can use without having to pay to reuse the materials. Um, and so that's the background sort of as we go through and talk about how to author these materials. On the next slide, I want to introduce um, our next speaker, so the next slide please, yep, um, who is gonna talk through the process of thinking through this sort of spectrum of adopting OER, of finding something that exists out there that will suit your purposes to creating it. Often I think people jump into the creating deep end um, and Anita is gonna talk through how different um, projects might require creation, but that you should think through ways to use existing OER in the scope of your project. Anita, thanks so much for joining us. Sure. Um, good afternoon. My name is Anita Wells. I'm the Assistant Director of Open Education and Scholarly Communication Librarian at Virginia Tech in Blacksburg, Virginia. I've been a librarian for 18 years and I've been involved with open education and open educational resources in higher ed since 2013. I want to talk to you about how course materials, about course materials in the context of decisions that you make for your classes specifically how some instructors have moved from adopt to adapt to create. I'll also provide some examples of how instructors have decided to move from adopting, adapting, and creating their, their own works. Uh, on the next, next slide, please. As instructors in higher education, you make critical decisions about how to support student learning. Next slide. These decisions relate to planning or redesigning courses, they relate to your environment, the course learning outcomes, whether or not you have control over them or if someone uh, else hands them to you. Uh, they relate to your role as the instructor. Are you a sage on the stage or a guide on the side? They relate to what kinds of things you'll ask students to do, listening, talking, doing, being, practicing, and they relate to tools that support student learning, content, uh, tools for sharing, tools for communication. They also relate to scheduling. What happens when? What happens before class, in class, after class? Or is everything asynchronous as so many of you are experiencing in this time? So instructors have very specific questions that they often come to uh, OER to resolve. How can I get my students to read? Course materials are too expensive. I teach this topic differently than everyone else. Where is the content for my topic? How do I make my course materials more interactive? All of these questions are very pedagogical. What we're going to talk a lot about today is content, but I want to situate that in the context of pedagogy. So there are things that we can control, namely our methods and our content, um, and there are things that we can't control. Next slide, please. Um, so I'd like you 
as a, a reflective exercise just to think about what do you like about your current course materials? What do you use? Um, what came with your, your commercial text if you use one? Um, what do you really need to be able to teach? Um, and then are there things that you can reasonably build? Can you build other things with help? Um, can you ask students to build with you? Um, we don't have time to stop and talk through all of these questions, um, but these are, are um, central to, um, to understanding what the potential applications could be for open course material in your course. If you have been on other webinars in the series, you will know that there are many kinds of course material artifacts that you could adopt. Next slide. Uh, these include videos, simulations, articles, books, software, the list goes on and on and on. But what if you cannot find what you need when you are trying to adopt? What if there's no comprehensive resource for your class? Um, you have three basic options. Next slide. You can curate, you can adapt, or you could create original content. Uh, next slide. Uh, curation. Um, includes pulling bits of content openly licensed perhaps from an open textbook uh, or used under a fair use analysis um, into your course. This could include diagrams, videos, text, other documents. Uh, there may be a, a far wider range of source materials available to you than you could imagine. This is a good, um, this is a good area when you cannot find something to get in touch with a librarian or an instructional designer. So we already know that you do this, <laughs> that you find all kinds of things on the web that are used in your course. Um, so let's move on to adapt. Next slide, please. Uh, sorry, next, uh, we're still in curate. <laughs> sorry, can you go back one, please? Thank you. Um, this is an example of a library funded project that was completed in 2020 by um, uh, Jessica Taylor and, um, Emily Stewart called Voices of Virginia. Uh, this is a collection of over 60 audio clips from archives and special collections all around Virginia. You don't have to do this, but if you said, hey, those, those clips fit what I want my students to listen to, those contextual discussions of um, context, of the history of uh, behind those clips, those fit exactly what I need them to be. Um, Amanda and, and I will talk more about how to, uh, how to customize and localize for your use, um, but this is a valuable example to say, let's pull together things that already exist into one place um, in order to be able to use them. Okay, next slide. Uh, in 2016, I worked with a faculty member who said, students aren't reading the book. The book is going to be $220 very soon. Uh, so what can I do? We went through, and this was a difficult process, we edited the whole book. I don't recommend doing that as a first project, um, but we did um, customize to fit the, the needs of our course. We slimmed the book down by about 50% uh, and um, added a lot of content that was very specific to um, the curriculum for this course. Next. Can I ask you to jump in and ask you a question about that project, Anita? Sorry, yeah. So you were saying there that the, um, the faculty member had been using a commercial textbook. Mm -hmm. That was too expensive. So he switched to an open textbook and then you rewrote the open textbook? He switched and we rewrote the open textbook. He didn't switch to the open one. He switched to the rewritten open one that we worked through, yes. Okay, so he found the, he was like, I don't wanna buy the commercial one. He found an open one, but it wasn't right for him. And then you went through and rewrote that open one. Yes. yes. Great, thanks. I just wanted to jump in and make sure that process was clear. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, so this book is available. It's freely online. It has been very popular. Uh, many, many, uh, over half a million downloads in the last four years. Uh, it also has a test bank because so many people contacted us to say, do you have a test bank? Do you have slides? So we we're able to fund um, a um, test bank development sprint um, as an ancillary to the book. We know not everyone teaches that way, um, but 
we thought this could be a valuable resource for all of these many people that are contacting us. Okay, so next slide, please. Um, creating. You're probably already creating things. In fact, many of you may already have uh, course notes, uh, you might have videos, you might have things that would be really valuable for other people to see. So two examples, uh, one of a video series, this is a series of four videos for veterinary medicine, it's how to examine a dog. Um, next slide. Uh, and in the same project, the curriculum changed um, significantly in veterinary medicine where they were euthanizing fewer animals and it's really hard to see through the skin of a dog. So we created a virtual reality dog uh, so that students can see what's inside of the dog. Uh, when the dog is upright, um, they can navigate to see the orientation of all, the, all of the organs within the dog. Uh, and it's been a, a really interesting um, experience for for us as um, people who are funding this and watching this happen to, to see how it's been, um, yeah, to see how it's been, um, how it has developed. Okay, next slide. Uh, and finally, um, we occasionally have faculty who say, you know, there is no reason <laughs> that I have that I can't share the course materials that I already have. Um, this professor, uh, Steve Ellingson from Virginia Tech, created um, his original um, series, two volumes of the electromagnetics um, textbooks written in LaTeX. Um, they also include a slide deck uh, for each book, problem sets and solutions for each book, and the LaTeX source files. Um, so I hope these give you some examples of um, small and large things that you could do. Uh, you don't have to do everything. Um, you could do a chapter at a time as you teach your course and see how it goes. Um, these did not happen overnight, um, but they happen with a very intentional plan to, to create. Um, so I'm going to turn this back over to Meredith. Great. Anita, if you can stand for one, question, or one or two questions. Um, sure. So I think one of the things this really illustrates is that, as you've said here, not only is this an open textbook that people can use for free, but there's a couple of really important things. One is that they have um, the slide decks of figures and problems and solutions. So some of these creation projects have focused on including ancillary materials like that as well. Yes. And yeah. I think that's a big part of adoption, right? Of having those available for people. They can, they can pick them up, they can use them. But also, as you said in your business example, we have here the editable source files so that, you know, if you have somebody who's like, but I really like the examples or the teaching approach in this other book, they could go through and resequence and align this to their preferences. Do you see that sort of use? We see that use uh, with regard to fundamentals of business. You'll see a little bit later on that there's a Canadian edition of the book oh, cool. um, that was created about a year ago. We do know that people are requesting the LaTeX source files. I've had several people indicate that they're adopting the book, that they're adapting it. There are three different ways to teach this course. History first, transmission lines first, or waves first, and every professor seems to have a different perspective. So this book specifically is written in LaTeX in a modular um, framing so that each of the sections can be moved around. Uh, we don't have any documented examples uh, for adaption of adaptation of um, the electromagnetics book, but we do have a few. Um, there are some examples of fundamentals of business. There's some translations. There are people who are using parts, um, people who are using a couple chapters or adding their own work um, in their own course management system. We make the Pressbooks files available for that as well. And a big feature of that book is the, the interactive features that we added. Great, thank you. And for those of you who are watching, one of the things I'd also like to um, encourage is if you've found a book you like, but um, you are looking for slide decks for supplementary to materials, to go ahead and reach out to the author and the other people involved in the publishing, librarians at the school it was published at, 
because often some of those resources exist but might not be formally published along with the book. So if you're thinking through finding something to adapt or adopt, I would also include that in your checklist of things to do. Can I add one other thing? Please. There are a number of, of um, adopter portals available in places like OER Commons. These books have one. Uh, the Fundamentals of Business book has one. This is a place where, where adopters can meet each other, where they can also share content that they have created for their courses. Um, That's great. That's an important part, I think, of making this effective. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so up next, we're going to hear um, from Karen Bjork. And so um, on the next slide, please, we'll see. She's going to talk about how, you know, once you've gone through um, Anita's sort of evaluation of, is there something out there that I can adopt as it is? Is there something out there that I can take and adapt? and sort of resequence or change to better fit my teaching approach. Or maybe I've already done those two searches and I've decided, no, I really want to sit down and write something from scratch. Or, as is often possible, you've already written your own materials that you've used in informal teaching as replacement curriculum. And you want to go through the steps of taking sort of notes and written material you already have and making it into a more formal, more packaged thing. Um, to sort of think through those steps of how you might do that publishing, how you might find help on your campus, and then how also projects at different um, campuses can connect through networks like the Open Textbook Network, we have uh, Karen Bjork. Karen, thanks so much for joining us. Will you tell us a little bit about yourself and about what you've been working on? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, so I'm head of digital uh, initiatives and scholarly publishing at Portland State University Library in Portland, Oregon. Um, I manage the institutional repository PDX Scholar, and I lead the university's open access textbook publishing initiative, PDX Open. As the lead um, project person, I'm really invested in ensuring that all of our faculty authors have a positive experience and that they're able to successfully complete their open uh, textbooks. Since inception, uh, PDX Open has published 23 faculty authored open access textbooks. All of them are available um, under Creative Commons license. So they um, are being adopted and adapted as well as utilized in classrooms within uh, Portland State as well as across the world. And our books have been downloaded over 260,000 times. Um, so for us, it's a, a really, it's been a really exciting project, um, but it's also led us to learn a lot about what does it mean to, uh, for the creation process for the author, how do you support authors, but then also how do you actually build a publishing program when you yourself have very little um, experience in publishing. Um, so I'm going to talk to you briefly about sort of how to build a project, um, give an overview of sort of uh, the, how we got started, things to consider, um, as well as then sort of the services that are out there that Meredith had mentioned. Uh, next slide, please. So building a program is essentially like building a community. Uh, you do not want to do this alone. If there's one thing that you take away from my short presentation is don't do this alone. There are a lot of people out there that are creating open access textbooks, um, a lot of uh, people are thinking about publishing programs. Um, so it's not, you know, it, this is really a community. And this is why I think these webinars are so awesome is because you can really see the community and uh, that it's growing. So you do want to build a team. Um, even as an author, you want to build a team to help support you. So you want to start small. Take on a project that you know that you can actually follow through on. It's really important to really know what you can support and really look at, you know, how you can grow your capacity over time. You really also want to be able to define expectations. Uh, if you are creating a publishing program, are you going to provide funding? What does that look like? Um, so while material may be free and open to use, it is not free to create. OER creation takes labor. And you really need to think about how are you going to compensate for that labor. If you are requesting that someone do a peer review or you're requesting someone to edit chapters, really think about the labor and time that it takes to do that. Or even as you as an author, will you want or need to get some levels of compensation? You also want to think about roles. What roles will your program offer versus 
you know, what will you expect authors to do? Are you going to require authors to be editors? Um, are you, as the program, going to be the editor? Will you have to go out and find designers, or are you going to design your book yourself? Um, identify partnerships. So the one that I'll be focusing on in particular is the Open Textbook Network. Um, they have a co-op uh, publishing program that will really help sort of guide what it means. Um, and community of practice. Really, it's, it's so important, um, particularly as authors or as a generating or creating a program, to introduce authors to each other. Have them share their projects. Invite them to discuss what's working and what they're struggling with. Enable them to, uh, to feel alone, enable them not to feel alone in the process. And again, it really does take a village. In regards to the community of practice, one of the things that we have done at Portland State is we require all of our authors to meet and, and participate in a workshop. And the whole purpose of the workshop is to do, introduce everyone. But then we also start to talk about what are the challenges? What, are, what has the author so far in their creation process? What are the roadblocks that they've hit? And it really allows each of the authors to get to know each other, to get to know their projects, and then to be able to provide that level of support that um, they, they, they need. And a lot of our authors end up connecting with each other throughout their projects and really you know, saying, hey, I, I, I know that you were working on this. I, hear, I remember you ran into this particular roadblock. Can you help me through this? Because I'm hitting this roadblock as well. So it's really about making sure to not do this alone. It's, it's that idea of a village. Uh, next slide, please. So what do I mean by open textbooks? So when I talk about open textbooks, I'm really talking about a structured publication uh, with consistent pedagogical elements. So it really needs to have openers and overview, key terms, case studies, closers, sort of reflective questions, quizzes, and summaries. We're not talking about monographs. What we are talking about are completed portable files. And when we talk about portable files, we're really talking about being able to make sure that you can have your open access textbook be a Word document, a PDF. Um, it could be in LaTeX. Uh, it can be in HTML. So whichever file and means um, that would allow others to be able to adopt and adapt your work, as well as openly licensed to allow for editing. Um, to allow others to edit, but to also allow you to edit. One of the things to really think about and consider is if you are creating a program at your university, what is your university's copyright policy? If you're giving and providing funding to the authors, who owns the copyright? So it's something to really think about and consider when you start to move forward. Uh, next slide, please. So what do I mean by publishing? So publishing, it takes time, as Anita said. None of, the, none of the projects which she focused on, you know, happened right away, and it's the same with all of our projects. I have been working with PDX Open since 2012. Many of our projects take anywhere between two to three years for the production piece, because authors um, are not only teaching their courses, but they're also writing and creating the open textbooks at the same time. So what I mean about publishing is you really want faculty to sort of focus on writing and the pedagogy, not the formatting tool. So that is the benefit of the OER, is that the author has the opportunity to teach with the material as they are creating it. So my program at Portland State, we require that faculty authors teach and gather feedback from their students before they publish. I have a book that's currently in creation, it's for a 100 level Spanish class, and the author is actually writing and teaching with the book. So she's writing a chapter, and a week later, she's using it in her course. So the students are actually providing real-time feedback and are participating in that creation. And then during the summer, she's going to actually integrate the students' feedback into the manuscript. So while this can be really intense, it actually ensures that she's meeting the pedagogical needs for her students, and it aligns with our program's mission to support materials that are designed specifically for PSU students. It also provides students with that unique opportunity to participate in the creation of their course material. Again, when we talk about publishing, we really are talking about those structured documents that can be easily updated, but we're also talking about contributions from professional copy editors, proofreaders, illustrators, designers, and other publishing experts. What we wanna see is a high finished printed product, 
plus additional file types. And we really want to be able to create an, um, an imprint or a branding for our publishing services. So when we really talk about publishing, we really are talking about uh, uh, enabling all of those high, like high level uh, publishing services and sort of essentially what we're thinking about as a press. But I would never call our um, sort of our service a press, but it is how I always try to describe it. Um, so next one, please. So the Open Textbook Network Publishing Co-op. So in the beginning, I talked and mentioned about identifying partnerships. So one of those partners that I have worked with is the Open Textbook Network. Um, the Open Textbook Network is a diverse community of higher education institutions that promote access, affordability, and student success through the use of open textbooks. The Open Textbook Network manages the open publishing, um, open manages the open textbook library and they run that publishing co-op. So if you are looking for open access textbooks, I always recommend um, first starting at that open textbook library. They actually go around and aggregate uh, open access textbooks from different universities and it's essentially allowing a one-stop shop. They also have reviews of open textbooks um, that are done by uh, faculty across universities. So you can really get a feel for um, what the book is like. Uh, the, so the goal of the publishing co-op is that it is really grounded in professional development and community. So it is a public, it is a flexible publishing model. And so in I, my past slide, I talked about sort of the copy editing, the design, the layout, and being able to offer those publishing services. Before the Open Textbook Network Publishing Co-op existed, I was not able to offer those services and the co-op is allowing me to be able to do that. It is providing that community of practice. Um, there are Google groups so all questions can be asked. They do a tea time once a month to allow um, publishing programs to get together and talk about successes, um, to also talk about uh, have questions that they have, and it really leverages everyone's experience. They also offer training and publishing workflows. So their training is called Pub 101, um, and it's really focused on how do you create an, how do you create a program? What does it look like? And it is um, about a four week course, and it's really in depth, and it does a really great deep dive, and it provides you with that knowledge that you need. They also offer press services. So they have a contract um, with Scribe Publishing that allows you to be able to get the editing design and production that you're looking for. It's all customizable and it allows for project support. They also have guidelines and templates. Um, the link that's available is actually to all of their publishing um, material and it is so helpful. I still go back every day, like not every day, but I still go back very often to take a look at it and to really help guide. Um, as I said before, I didn't have the publishing expertise until the publishing co-op existed. And this is what has allowed me to sort of leverage our program and to be able to provide those publishing services that our authors were asking for that we just didn't have the capacity to do. Uh, next slide, please. So before I wrap up, I just wanted to show an example of what publishing services um, can do for a book. So this is uh, one of our open access textbook published uh, books that we have published. It is a philosophy book. It's called Inferring and Explaining. Um, and you can see the before and after. So you can, uh, you can see how the publishing services have really uh, essentially made the book look really sleek. Uh, it's the author. This is what the author was seeking. They've put a lot of time and energy into the creation piece and they want their book to be that reflection of the amount of work. Um, and it really has been what our authors were asking us for. Um, so you can really see the difference. Um, so I hope I've provided you with a few things to consider as you look to build your own program. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Um, just a few sort of quick questions from that. One of the things that sounded like is that often, you know, there isn't, this isn't quite the same as a traditional publishing timeline where you keep all your stuff secret and sort of unused and in your dark archive until you're ready for your big publication moment. That it's actually more gradual than that, that people are using their teaching materials now, but working towards um, a sort of final, more useful public publication. So I know like, 
in this moment, a lot of people are thinking about what do I need to do to create materials that are going to be resilient in the shade in the face of a really unpredictable fall, and at the same time, you know, ones that will be high quality and keep up the standard of teaching. And I think people are often worried about sharing their initial sort of unpolished version, and that might be reasonable in some situations. And so it's sort of that process of like figuring out what's the spectrum from creating stuff to use right now and working towards a public publication. Right. And I think that um, you really do need to, to put that information out front um, for the students. So the professors that I work with, one of the things they do is they incorporate it into their syllabi. They say, look, I, I'm creating an open access textbook book. One of the things we're going to be doing in class is really focused on the pedagogy of this book. And it's, it's sort of become a part of the student's participation piece. So that's how, like one of the professors that I've worked with, that's, that's what she uses for participation. Not only class participation, but also feedback on the course material. And the feedback that we have gotten from the students in particular is they don't care as much if the material is less polished. What they're really focused on and what they really like is the idea that the faculty is creating material specifically designed for them and that course. And they really have enjoyed and the faculty have actually found that the students are much more engaged when they are given the opportunity to participate and provide feedback on the material. So it's really about not hiding what you've created and really sharing it out and allowing it to become a better, more rich course content and course material. The other thing we also require is that all of the books actually go and get reviewed by open reviewers. So uh, each of the authors have to identify uh, a professor outside of our university to provide a feedback and say, hey, if I were to teach with this book, what would I want to see and what would I change? So it's very much an open process. And, and we really want to make sure that we're transparent with everyone coming in as to what stage the book is in. But I feel like it provides a, a higher level of, of impact and student engagement than what you would see, even if the materials are not clean and they, you know, they're not as polished as what you would like. Great. I thank you so much. I think, you know, particularly in this moment when a lot of traditional ways for doing student assessment and student engagement might be disruptive because you're not in person, thinking right. through ways to do that by engaging with the text could be really powerful. Yeah, and we've seen a number of case studies of how this has been really successful. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, so up next uh, on the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit about you know, once you take that next step and say, I've got these materials, they're working for me in my classroom, in my teaching, and I want to formalize them and publish them so that other people in my department, other people in other universities can use them. There's a couple of different things to think through in that step from going, you know, I think I have the good backbone of something to having a resource that's published and usable um, and sort of exists out there in the world for people to use. Finding a good platform and a good system for that is really important. And um, at that sort of intersection of community platform and technical system, um, Aperva is going to talk to us a little bit about the two projects she works with at Pressbooks and Rebus and how that can sort of come together. Aperva, thanks so much for joining us. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and about the projects you're working on? Sure, thank you, Meredith, and thank you, Karen. So I'll just mention that Karen has talked briefly about building capacity through that publishing program, but I know that some of you might be at an earlier stage with your institution or at your community college. Um, you might not have a program established yet, and it might take you a while to get up to speed, and you might need resources right in the current moment. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. So I'm Apurva Ashok. I work with the Rebus community, which is a free global community of creators working on collaborative publishing projects. Um, I used to work at Pressbooks, which is an open source uh, book formatting tool, and I'll go into that in a little more detail. Um, on the Rebus side, I've actually managed um, and supported the publication of about 35 to 40 uh, different projects all around the world. Um, and what we've also done is written about our experience with these projects and documented our publishing process in the form of a guide, um, the Rebus Guide to Publishing Open Textbooks so far. So of course, if you want to nerd out about publishing, you can do a deep dive into this 
process. Um, but for today's session, I actually want to dive into how we can condense it. Um, how can you plan for publishing to take place in a very short time frame, especially if you're creating resources for the coming fall? Next slide, please. As Anita and Karen have described, um, there's a lot of different ways that you can step into the world of OER and open education and creation specifically. These projects can involve creating new open textbooks, but as you've seen right now, it's not necessarily limited to just a textbook. There's a range of possibilities with OER. Um, you can work on replacing your existing commercial textbook. You can work on putting together ancillary learning materials, creating question banks, assignments, reading lists, and more. Um, your project can also involve working with uh, existing content. We'll share a few examples of some of these kinds of projects later on in the webinar that can hopefully inspire you a bit more and help you plan out your own project. Um, regardless of what you're working on, though, I'll note that the projects can expand to fill the time that you assign to them. So you could say, I have six months to work on this, I have three months to work on this, or just a few weeks. Um, the project can fill in that time. And the beauty of open text is that improvements can always be made to the continuous resource um, over the lifetime of the resource. This is what Karen was alluding to when she was answering that last question. You can always make changes to content over time. Um, we've seen, though, that it is possible to put together something that is well-designed, high quality in a short time frame. And OER actually lends itself to doing this kind of work. So for us, um, the best way to start this kind of project is with planning. We think that laying out the groundwork makes it easier for you to focus and complete those tasks once the project is up and running. Um, and it also prompts you to think through some of the big decisions surrounding your resource earlier on. So we've put together um, a list of questions in uh, what we call a project scoping template. And I'd, consider, uh, I'd encourage you to consider some of these questions. Who is your audience? Um, what are your needs? And with these questions, try to think beyond just, you know, I'm designing uh, a book for this Philosophy 101 course, um, but think about um, what level that course is. What is the makeup of your class? What are your students' reading levels? What is their background? Um, and use the time to also consider your own needs a little more carefully. Do you need to supplement your materials with another resource? Do you need to start from scratch? Think through some of those questions that Anita had shared earlier on. This is also a good moment to pencil in a target completion date, um, which in turn might prompt you to revisit those first two questions. So if you thought you wanted to create a new course, but you realize you only have two weeks um, to get something together, that might not be the best project to tackle right away. Next slide, please. Once you've answered these questions and you have a basic idea for your project in uh, development, you can broaden your web. As Karen has alluded thus far, there's a big community and network that you can tap into for support. You're not in this alone, or as the slide says, we aren't in this alone. There's instructors all around the world grappling with similar issues and questions, whether it's someone trying to figure out how to deliver their physics assignment remotely, um, how to engage uh, students in their English class um, with their readings more collaboratively. Um, we can all work with one another to create resources that fits our collective needs. And working with others also means that you're getting new perspectives, diverse experiences, diverse skill sets that end up strengthening your resource over time. So the best place to start, I would suggest, is to look at your immediate network. Um, is there a colleague in your department that you can coordinate with? Is there an instructional designer or a librarian or a publishing program administrator on your campus that you can work with? Is there someone from your state board of education who can provide you some assistance? And then you can cast your net out wider to see if there's someone else you can work with around the world. So you can use the Rebus platform to connect with other people in your discipline, to share calls for participation on projects that you have, or to communicate publicly about your project. You can also look at different open education groups. Um, there's the CCC OER, which is a great support group for um, those who are working at community colleges. Um, there's the OTN, there's Spark, and I know that um, the Creative Commons group also has chapters all around the world. So they have global affiliate networks that you can reach into. So tap into these groups if you need additional help, whether it's for an intensive portion of the process like writing or peer review, or whether it's for something smaller um, like proofreading. As Anita has noted, um, support can also come in the form of ready-made existing OER content. 
sometimes the best path forward is to use and work with what is already out there without needing to reinvent the wheel. Part of this project scoping work that we do um, before starting a project can involve that quick search in your library database or OER repository for materials um, that might already align with the goals that you've identified. So you can then instead work on curating the content versus starting writing it from scratch. Um, and this saves a lot of time that you can devote elsewhere. Next slide, please. So once you have a sense of what you'll be working on and who will be supporting you, the only other component to really plan out is to decide on what tools you want to use and how you're actually going to go about sharing this information with your students and with other instructors. Right off the bat, I want to assure all of you that um, you don't need an advanced degree in computer science or graphic design to use open publishing tools. There are a lot of tools out there that are designed to be very simple and easy to use so that anyone anywhere in the world can pick it up quickly and publish the content that they need. It's also good to consider at this point what formats you want to make your OER available in. So we recommend sharing your work in a web format, so like a website, an offline format like a downloadable PDF, ebook, or a print copy, basically something that someone can access uh, without the internet. And lastly, an editable format. So something, as Karen was saying, that can be compatible with a word processor or easily transferred into another publishing tool to be edited. Providing these options to students will give them flexibility of choice when it comes to deciding how they want to access and read materials. Uh, I'll say for students who might not have stable or reliable internet access right now, or for many of them who might have family members in their household vying for use of that one computer that they have, um, providing more options can alleviate some of the stress that they're facing. And these um, multi-formats will also strengthen the open license that you've assigned to the resource. So other instructors who are coming across your resource can easily use one of these formats to incorporate it into their own materials if they choose to do so. For us, we found that Pressbooks is the easiest tool um, with which to format and to share OER. It's an open source book formatting software that creates books, not just in these three formats, but many more. Um, and it also lets you add things like um, formulae, images, multimedia elements, quizzes, videos, assessments, um, and also even annotation tools to help students read um, content collaboratively. Right now, uh, Pressbooks is actually giving all educators access to create one free book via the Open and Online Initiative. So if you wanted to trial out the tool and see if um, it can be good for you to use for your current project, um, I can put the details to um, the initiative in the chat. So once you've selected your tool, you're all set to begin the work of writing or curating. And as I mentioned, um, there's a lot more to this process. So if you did want to go back and think about uh, what else is involved in publishing, you can look at our comprehensive guide. Um, you can also look at um, the Rebus tools as a pathway to connect with other members and to go about creating your project. You can share information about the project as it's being worked on or once it's been announced. Um, I think what's important is to be vocal about the work you're doing, even if it's only at the very end to announce its availability. Um, I know Amanda is going to go into a little bit of detail about um, working with teams specifically, so I'll let her uh, touch on that. Next slide, please. What I've put together um, right at the end here is just an example of a completed scoping template. So this is one that I've put uh, together for a philosophy project. I've identified my audience, not just as students of introductory philosophy courses, but also a little more. I've said they are unfamiliar with terms and traditions of philosophy. And then I've gone ahead and described the project. So in this case, I'm creating a book for ethics specifically, um, and I want it to be ready fall 2020, which gives me about four months to complete this resource. And then I've listed um, what I already have. So in this case, I have a public commu communications page on Rebus community. I have a set of editors. I have help from my local librarian, a book cover, um, and I've even found existing OER from which I can remix content. All I need is a few more authors to help me complete this work and a copy editor to review content. And lastly, I've decided on my license. I'm going with CC BY because it permits the widest range of uses of my OER. So once this is all identified, I can go ahead and start creating this ethics book. Now, this is just an example. Um, your project might develop in different ways, and that's okay. 
I think you can always look back at this template and this initial information that you've put together to confirm whether you're on the right track with your project. Is it headed in the direction that you wanted? Regardless of whether you're going at it solo or whether you're going at it with the backing of a publishing program and a larger team. So that's it for me and I'll turn it over to Meredith. Thank you so much. I think that's a great look at a lot of the sort of duts and bolts and also a reminder of something that I think we've heard in every single context, which is if you think you need to do this alone, you're probably doing it the hard way that, you know, finding your team and finding your allies is really important. Um, on the next slide, we're gonna briefly introduce um, Amanda Coolidge, and she's gonna talk to us a little bit about how to, um, in their model, you sort of build this structure of thinking through finding versus adapting content. But then also I think really importantly, how to build a team, not just for those first few months or weeks in a book's lifespan where you create the content and review it, and, but also how to build a team that does ongoing review and update and maintenance of this book going forward so that it can be improved and so that more people can use it and benefit. Um, Amanda, thank you so much for joining us. Will you tell us just a little bit about yourself and the project you're working on? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Amanda Coolidge. I am the Director of Open Education at BC Campus, which is in British Columbia, Canada. Uh, we have an open education project that's primarily known for open textbooks. We have over 300 open textbooks in our collection. Um, and you can go to that by going to open.bccampus.ca. Um, and today I wanna kind of focus on uh, creating teams to be able to respond to creation, adaptation, and of course, finally adoption. So really building on the work that um, Anita Aperba and Karen have spoken about. Next slide. So the first thing, um, as mentioned in the previous presentations, it's really important to start with um, identifying what already exists. And the reason for this is because there's many times that you don't need to actually start from scratch by creating um, from the beginning. So this is an example of an inventory we've been doing as we've been looking towards our associate science degree. Um, we're looking at creating a zero textbook cost program for that. And so what we're trying to do is identify which um, open textbooks or OER align with the courses. And this is one thing to do is to do subject, identify the OER titles, and then look at the links. Next slide. The next thing to do is to ask yourself, can you adopt as is, which is if the answer is yes, then great, just add the link to your course and use. But if the answer is no, which sometimes happens, the best thing to do is to start by reviewing. Um, I've added a link there to the BC Open Textbooks review rubric, which allows you to see what, how we review for the open textbooks. The best thing to do is to identify what needs to be changed, removed, or added. And in many times, this is related to areas, um, either you're updating the materials so that they're more relevant for today's student, you might be updating them for inclusiveness, so changing pronouns, or um, perhaps even specific names of um, people that are referenced. And you might also be localizing the content. So in many cases in Canada, we've been able to use the OpenStax books or other books from the United States, but we have had to Canadianize the book. And by Canadianize, I mean using more examples that are relevant within Canada, uh, responsive to our government or to issues that are um, related to indigenization, which is um, an area that we've really been um, working on here in uh, Canada and or our uh, measurement system. So you may or may not know that we use the uh, metric system. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the things I wanted to really focus on in my talk today was to um, give you three different examples of what we mean by team development. Um, so as everyone has mentioned, it's always really great if you can bring together some folks within your discipline to start developing as a whole, um, as a team. And one of the things I think Anita really brought up that's super important is if there's an opportunity for you to liaise with a librarian or someone in a teaching and learning center, like an instructional designer, all the better. Um, I think you really need to have that team approach, that collaborative approach, 
Um, and here are some ways that we've done that. So one of the ways we have done is um, we created a British Columbia in a global context. So this came out of us doing an inventory. We identified that we needed a, a geography open textbook and specifically we needed a British Columbia um, open textbook. And of course one didn't exist in this arena. So what we did is we brought together five geography instructors from across different institutions and we basically sat them down for five days and we established what was called the sprint model. So we did an open textbook sprint where we um, worked together as a group over the course of five days to identify what would the outline of the book be, who would be best suited to research and write some of the chapters, and we had a librarian present there as well as a graphic artist. So we were really fortunate to have those tool sets. If you don't have those, um, those specific researchers or the graphic artist on board with you right away, that's okay. The main idea here is to get the content in. And so being able to set aside that concentrated amount of time was incredibly helpful for the instructors to um, write and then review another person's work and then rewrite and then go for a final edit. At the end of that, it meant we came out with a book. And it didn't necessarily mean that the book was completed in the sense that it had been copy edited or reviewed, but that was our next step. And so what we were able to do in that sprint model was to be able to create this bulk, um, this like initial content. Another example that we've seen work really well is um, a book that was written um, by an instructor. It's called the Ancient and Medieval World History Book. And initially the instructor had this plan on writing the book herself and using student, um, student support to make this happen. And what we realized, or what she soon realized, is that she really needed to take a modularized approach to maximize the ability of a broad range of contributors to add to the work. So she really needed the contributors to, be, to really identify a thematic area. They were to provide three to five primary documents, two to three visual artifacts, and a brief introduction to the key issues related to the theme. And um, what this helped with was, again, this really helped to this idea of dividing and conquering. She realized that she actually didn't have the expertise that would be needed to really go into the detail of the primary documentation she required, as well as the visual artifacts. And so what she did is she reached out to um, instructors across British Columbia, and we're fortunate in British Columbia to have what we call articulation committees, which are subject specific committees related to a specific subject that talk about ways that courses transfer across the system. And it's uh, basically talking about curriculum development and modeling. So if you're able to, there's, it's always great to be able to put out a note to your um, association or to your subject specific um, committees to see if anybody would be willing and interested in partaking. One of the things when you're modularizing an open textbook, for example, is it makes it a little bit easier for people to contribute because you're offering them a smaller chunk of the work. The last example really speaks to the sustainability of this work and it's something Meredith alluded to when she was doing the introduction. This book, Introduction to Tourism and Hospitality, was a book that we put a call out at BC campus. We asked instructors across BC to uh, put in a call to, um, to write an open textbook related to tourism for British Columbia. And one of the um, instructors came forward and said, our group of tourism instructors across the province would like to put in a joint proposal whereby we are the uh, authors of this book as well as the caretakers of this book. And what they mean by that is they wrote this book about four years ago. Since the four years, they have been adopting this book quite widely across all of their institutions and within all of their courses. However, in the last year, they went, as they were going through and they met as a group, they realized that a couple of the organizations actually no longer exist in the book. Further, this book was created four years ago and they, um, the interest in, in really um, changing pronouns, changing examples to be much more culturally sensitive and indigenizing some of the work 
hadn't been as relevant to these instructors. So um, they're actually working this week to be able to do those reviews and those updates together. And then in the next um, month, they're actually going to be working on this book to create H5P interactivity, which will allow for formative assessment within the book. And the reason this is really great is because this is exactly that community development model that OPEN really um, encourages and perpetuates. So this idea that one group would take ownership of a book, continue this work, and then it, the more you continue to revise and review, the less you have to do at the end of this entire project. Um, or sorry, the less you have to do when it comes to um, having to do a huge overhaul in let's say seven to 10 years. So it's really great that they've been able to do that. One last, next slide. The final thing I just wanted to showcase is you may be interested in taking a look at our BC campus um, self publishing guide. And the reason I bring this to your attention is because it really has been a powerful reference, not just for groups, but for also individuals, individuals individuals who are interested in writing or self-publishing an open textbook. And I think you'll find that the step-by-step -step procedure that's offered in that guide would be really helpful in terms of starting your project, working through your project, identifying collaborators, and then finally getting it ready for publication. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think that the, you know, the whole part of the model is important, but particularly thinking through you're authoring communities, you're authoring teams, the people who came together to do that, not just being responsible for the first steps, but also for thinking through, is this book still serving its purpose? Mm -hmm. What can we do to make it more useful? What can we do to keep it relevant and get people to adopt it? So, yeah, you know, thinking through those, are those teams primarily in the same institution or across institutions? No. That's what's really cool about these teams is they're cross institution. Um, and what I love about that is that means that we can see multiple adoptions across multiple institutions. Um, and that's been a real positive for us. There are some times when we really only work with just one institution to create something and then they have a team within that, that subsection. But it's been the, the ones that we've seen the most powerful response to have been those cross institutional ones. And in those situations, is there funding for that, or are these primarily projects that are supported? Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's a great question. So, again, we're fortunate in British Columbia because our Ministry of Advanced Education, um, they are our primary funder, and in April of 2019 gave us $3 million to work on uh, open education projects. And so we are able to provide funding for this work, and even more so now with the um, with and COVID happening and sort of this switch pivot to online, there's been much more, much more of an awareness from our ministry as well as the institutions and their administrative work is much more of an awareness that, that when folks are doing this work, they can no longer just do it off the side of their desk, but that we do need to provide funding so that their work is seen, appreciated, and they're receiving something in return as a result of it. Um, but yes, it's primarily funded. Thank you. Um, and so we're gonna have a little bit of time at the end of the program to talk through questions. And I would just say that um, Anita and Aperva and Karen, if you can keep some time then to talk about different funding models, um, either micro grants or course releases mm -hmm. that you've seen, that would be very useful then. Thanks so much, Amanda. You're welcome. Um, one more thing I would just say is as we, you know, everyone's thinking about the budgetary piece of this, you know, we have seen evidence that we discussed in earlier webinars about how um, OER can help with retention and completion. And so when your institution is facing um, the financial challenges that most institutions will change face in the fall, small upfront investments in OER that increase student retention and completion can actually be a cost saving measure for institutions. Um, so we're gonna pivot a little bit and talk about um, creating open educational resources from a sort of how to think through the writing itself, the content itself. Um, and it's important to remember, I think this was really well emphasized in a broad context in our, from our first four speakers, but creating OER is not a closed book exam, right? All of those speakers talked through, finding what is there, finding your team, and um, I'm going to turn to Will Cross, 
my colleague from NC State to talk a little bit about, from a copyright standpoint, how to understand all those different things out there that you'll need to draw from when you create OER. Thanks so much for joining us, Will. Great, thank you, Meredith. So yeah, I'm, I'm Will from NC State. Uh, as Meredith said, I'm a lawyer and also a librarian, so I'm a lot of fun at parties. Um, and I think my charge here is to talk a little bit about the way copyright can be a real source of sort of material for the OER work that you do. And that, that might sound a little surprising to folks that copyright that we think of as a limitation is actually a really powerful source for the creative work that we do. Um, but as, as we say on the next slide, um, uh, where we lay a very quick foundational sort of basics of copyright. Copyright is actually really about balance. And I'm gonna say this in like 45 seconds or something, but if you wanna know more about it, you can go to our first webinar, which Doug, actually our first couple of webinars, dug pretty deep on these copyright issues. Um, so copyright, because it's about balance, really supports the creation of open educational resources in a few different ways. So to start with the foundational piece, copyright, as you probably know, is balanced in that there are some ways that it's very broad and some ways that it's very narrow or limited. Um, so copyright is very broad, for example, in that it's pretty easy to get copyright in something. If, as long as something is original, creative, and fixed in a medium where other people can see it, it's protected by copyright. Um, we usually talk about that in terms of literary, artistic, or musical works, but it can be pretty much anything. Um, copyright is also really broad in that it happens automatically. So if you're on Twitter right now going like, oh my God, we're an hour in and they're talking about copyright, what are we doing? I can't believe this. Good news. You're a rights holder. You own copyright in that snarky tweet um, and you're going to own copyright for a long, long time because copyright lasts life plus 70 for an individual and um, 95 for an institution or similar. So, so that's a, in one sense, that's a broad aspect of copyright. It lasts for a long time. It's also, though, narrow in the sense that copyright does expire, and that's a feature, not a bug, right? The reason that we have copyright is to offer a short-term incentive, um, whether or not you believe Life Plus 70 is short-term or not, we can discuss, but a short-term incentive to get people to stock a robust public domain. That's the real purpose of copyright, that like Lana Del Rey, copyright is born to die. So that's the broad stuff. It happens automatically. It covers a bunch of things. It lasts a long time, etc. The limitation piece, the narrowness, though, is just as significant. And that's going to be the place where we really talk about OER creation. Um, copyright gives rights holders the ability to control certain behaviors, but not all uses of the material. So the bundle of rights that lawyers talk about that copyright confers are things like to make a reproduction, to create a derivative work, to publicly perform or display, that sort of thing. But there are lots and lots of uses that don't necessarily implicate copyright. So an easy example here is most popular songs right now are protected by copyright. But if I am in my shower singing that tune to myself, nobody's gonna like break in and arrest me for violating copyright for singing in the shower, right? Copyright doesn't implicate singing in the shower in that way. That's not, not one of the bundle of rights. Um, copyright is also limited really substantially in that it doesn't cover a lot of things like functional concepts, names, facts, uh, often words or short phrases, and I, in particular, ideas. So if I decide I want to write a great novel, and I write a story about a young boy having an owl come to visit him and going off to wizarding school and making new friends and having adventures, I can do that. Copyright doesn't limit my ability to write that novel. If I call that boy Harry Potter and he goes to a place called Hogwarts, that starts to look like we're actually sort of dealing with the expressive work of J.K. Rowling, not just the ideas that she put forward. Um, but that idea, that sort of idea expression distinction that we talk about is a really substantial limitation on copyright that we're going to talk about in terms of the way it supports open education and the creation specifically of open educational resources. Copyright is also limited in really important ways by specific exceptions and by a general exception to copyright. Um, these are areas that, in, on one side, the specific exceptions where Congress has sort of carved out a type of behavior and a group, like classroom teachers engaged in face-to-face -face instruction and said, like, the work you do forwards the aims that copyright is supposed to forward, so we're just going to carve out an exception for you. If you're in a classroom and you're doing face-to-face -face education, play that song, read that play, watch that movie, and don't worry about copyright. Along with those specific exceptions, there's this sort of exceptional exception called fair use, uh, and Meredith and Peter are going to get into that some more, but that's one of the most powerful tools we have when we're doing our own creation of open educational resources. So that's the balanced stuff. That's the basics of copyright. 
broad in these ways, limited in these ways. If we could have the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about, on this next slide, about the ways that that supports OER creation. And Meredith, I love your turn of phrase, OER creation is not a closed book test, that, right? The obligation in a world with copyright is not to sit in a completely empty room and wait for the muse to descend into your head and like shine forth the genius that is yours and only yours. Copyright law acknowledges that we stand on the shoulders of giants all the time. Um, and so what that looks like in terms of that balance that we talked about before uh, are things like this. First, the idea expression idea that I mentioned a minute ago. Copy, a minute ago, copyright protects expression, but not ideas. What that means is a lot of the things that we glean from education and from a textbook, the structure of an assignment, the set of theories being presented, the methods of instruction being used, right? The, the way that worksheet is designed are not protected by copyright. So you can take an existing resource, open or commercial and completely closed and say, I love the way they talk about the theory of gravity, or I love the way they present that sociological concept and just borrow it and use it. And, and there's the attribution conversation that we always have because we're responsible professionals. Um, but, but the actual ideas are there for anybody to use. Secondly, the duration piece we talked about, the copyright expires piece. Because copyright lasts a long time, but not forever, um, the result of that is works from 1924 and previous, if they were published before then without getting too much into the nerdy weeds, are likely to be in the public domain. What that means is that most of recorded history is free and open for anybody to use at any time. And that's really, really powerful. A lot of the great OER that we do at my campus are based on materials in our special collections that copyright has expired. And so we bring them in in different ways, right? You have this huge body of material to build on that's just no longer protected by copyright at all. The third way that OER creation is not like a closed book test is that as we've already said several times, there's this huge and growing body of openly licensed materials. We've pointed to things like the Open Textbook Library, CC Search, or Wikimedia, places that a lot of people are familiar with that you can find resources. You can go to Google Images and use your, use your sub-search, and you can find materials that way as well. Um, we also, I'll say again, we did a webinar a little earlier on discovery, sort of finding those materials. So if you want to know more about where can I find openly licensed stuff, I'll refer you to that webinar as well. And then sort of moving even further down the spectrum, as it were, even if what you want to build on or engage with is a closed resource, something that is protected by copyright and all rights reserved, there are still a lot of important ways that you can use those resources based on those exceptions we talked about, right? So the, the 110 one face-to-face -face teaching, you can show it in the classroom, you can perform it in different ways, etc. But the really exciting stuff and the stuff I'm going to let Meredith and Peter talk about is the way that fair use lets us make especially transformative uses of any material that's necessary for your teaching and learning. So on that note, I'm gonna get out of the way and let Meredith and Peter talk about fair use. Thank you so much, Will. Uh, on the next slide, we have a sort of flow chart to think through these. As Will said, you know, you need to sort of start the question of, is this thing protected by copyright law? And there are these two big important pools of information that can be a source that are not. One is the world of ideas and facts and just information about the universe. Those things, the ideas, the factual data, the um, just sort of background knowledge of the way the world works and the things that have happened, all of that is not protected by copyright law. Copyright law protects the specific writing, the book, the song, the movie, but the underlying information that is in those, in those resources, the ideas and the data, is not protected by copyright law. In specific instances, you might need to attribute that for reasons of ethics and attribution and plagiarism, but that's a separate question and it doesn't have to do with whether or not you can use the ideas and the information in creating your OER. So that's the first important thing to know. The second, as well mentioned, is materials that are in the public domain. And then, as was talked about extensively in the um, beginning of this, is all of the existing openly licensed OER. You can use all of that, repurpose it, tear it apart and put it back together, take just images and pictures and figures and write your own text. All of that can go into your OER creation. But the other very important piece is the ability to rely on fair use in the United States or fair dealing in Canada. 
to include existing third party material that is not under an open license. And thinking through fair use or fair dealing is a process that you have to do in each individual case, but it is hugely powerful because it allows you to include existing things like documentary, film, excerpts, images, poems, excerpts from literature, things that already exist as cultural or historical experiences out in the world that in order to do a responsible job of teaching, you cannot recreate, you have to include directly. So on the next slide, we have the basic outline of how you think through fair use in the United States. We're not going to cover fair dealing specifically on this webinar, but in two Fridays, we're going to have a webinar that talks a little bit about how fair dealing and fair use sort of compare in this open educational space and why, in fact, they allow most of the same types of included materials. So under fair use in the US and the statute, it's a four factor test, but pragmatically, it's really been condensed down to two core questions, which is, are you doing something new and different, something with a transformative purpose with this material? And is the amount you're using, whether a part or the whole of the original object, appropriate to the new thing you're going to do? If the answer to both of those questions is yes, then it's unlikely that what you're doing is a substitute for the original copyright work in its intended market, which is the only sort of financial issue that's relevant to fair use. So, on the next slide, we're gonna talk about some examples of how this plays out in action. In the United States, fair use is the exception to copyright law that allows for critique and analysis, for quotation, for using works to illustrate an argument or to promote accessibility, to make copies for people with print disabilities or other access disabilities. It also permits uh, glossing and translation and language learning and taking works and critiquing them for media literacy. All of these tactics can be part of your plan when you're creating new open educational resources. It's also important to remember that many of these works are in fact orphan works. They're ones that are created for a short ephemeral purpose, like a tweet or a poster or um, an announcement, things that have copyright, because as Will said, copyright is automatic, but there's no way to come and sort of later get permission to use them. On the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about how that plays out in a specific OER. So examples that might be relevant for the creation of OER are excerpting a passage for close reading. So for glossing uh, unfamiliar words or concepts, for adding in discussion questions, or for um, scaffolding and translation for language teaching. Another example might be using an image or a historical article to illustrate a teaching point or document a historical event. Um, and finally, you might also include images and source material from teaching materials in a student activity or assessment. And on the next slide, I'll talk about how to document that in your work when you do. So as you come into a situation and you're writing your OER and you want to use a third party material, the first question is, what is your purpose? What's my pedagogical purpose for using this? And so you understand, okay, this is why, from a teaching standpoint, it's important to use this object, this excerpt or this photograph. Then your next question is, is this a transformative use? Am I using this for a purpose that is different than its original purpose out there? Was this originally a news photograph, and now I'm using it in a history textbook to document the political reality of the 1960s? Are you using it for a new purpose? And then finally, does it substitute in the market for the original? And that's not a question of, could you in theory pay for a license? The question is, if this was originally sold for a purpose, it was sold to be a newspaper, it was sold to be popular fiction, are you reasonably competing or substituting for that original purpose in the market? So once you've thought that through, it's important to document it. So first of all, you have to say, this is not included under your open license. So at the front of an open textbook or an open educational resource, you'll also often see the license text that says, except where otherwise noted, this is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution license. And that's important because 
you as the author don't have the ability to relicense the stuff that you didn't create. You need to identify those third party materials and say, these are included under fair use. They're not something that I as the author can give you this open license. However, it's also important to document your reasoning because your reasoning is tied to the context of the book. And so if you've included this image because it illustrates the historical point in the book, that reasoning, that fair use context, carries forward for other people in their use of that same third party image in the context of the OER. So what that means pragmatically is, there's a lot of discussion that says, OER is context specific, that you have to, you know, each user has to think through that for themselves. And that's true as far as it goes. But what's important to remember is within the context of creating open textbooks or other open resources, the context for that use is the resource. So if I were to include a painting in a art history OER, a, an image of a painting, and someone else were to take that art history OER and disagreed with me about the politics of the New York art scene in the 1950s and 60s, they might make that edit. But the fair use context, that's not changed. So if my fair use analysis was correct, then they are, you know, to every reasonable degree of certainty going to have the same fair use context. So you don't need to go in and strip out fair use images. You just need to go in and say, you know, do I understand what their teaching purpose was here? Does that make sense to me that it's reasonable? Then you can go ahead. Um, and so in that way, fair use analysis is context specific, but the object is the context. So that context sort of travels with the use. The counter example would be if you have included um, images in your OER under fair use, and I want to take those images, cut them out, you know, cut and paste them out, and then print shower curtains, that's obviously a different use, and I would need to make a different analysis. So for authors, you can rely on fair use, but just explain your purpose. And for users, you don't need to sort of start from scratch, but you should go through and just understand which are the original content and which is the fair use and make sure that it lines up, you know, you understand the teaching purpose. On the next slide, we'll talk about a few red flags for thinking through this, some caution flags as it were. So when you're including third party materials under fair use, you should probably avoid ones that are designed mainly to sort of set a mood or grab attention that aren't tied to a teaching purpose. Um, also, avoid uses that aren't proportionate. If students are examining a short passage, don't include the whole work. And then finally, as we talked about earlier, um, one of the questions in the fair use analysis is, are you sort of substituting in the market for the original market for the work? And so while there are certainly some instances where using excerpts from commercial educational materials are fair use, I would proceed with caution there and really think through are you using this for a different purpose or are you fundamentally using it for the same purpose it was originally created? And on the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit about fair use in context. So um, as many of you may know, fair use works in all sorts of different content creation and publishing contexts. So um, in book reviews, in newspapers, in criticism, in software publishing, in movies, in book publishing, and in search, right? All of the biggest companies that do anything about content rely on fair use. Fair use is also part of how many of the big educational testing organizations take passages to use. It's a core part of the way the information economy works but often the sort of private reliance on fair use isn't matched. People don't talk about their reliance on fair use in public. So it's easy to think that fair use in the sort of industrial world is always this cut and, you know, hard cut and dry limit, when in fact it's um, something that is a part of the balance that is intended in the copyright system. On the next slide, um, 
we'll see a little bit about that background. We sort of talk through this that it's used throughout. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the courts have been pretty clear here, especially in the last 25 years since 1994, that um, fair use is a core part of how parody and remix, appropriation, scholarship, technology, and many other disciplines engage with existing copyrighted work. Next slide. Um, and as we'll talk about a little bit later in this presentation, there are ways in which communities like the OER community can understand this through community consensus and best practices. And we're gonna be working on one of those. We'll talk a little bit about it at the end of the presentation. Up next to talk about building your team, we have Will Cross. Can we have the next slide, please? So Will's gonna briefly go over some ways to repurpose OER, which was covered some up front, and then talk about finding help at your library. Thank, welcome back, Will. Thanks, happy to be back. So we, we, I think we've said this pretty well already, but we just wanted to really emphasize an open educational resource is open, so that means you can adopt it for its explicit purpose, or it can be sort of recontextualized, localized, customized in a lot of different ways. You can take images from this textbook and use them in a different level of textbook or a different kind of textbook, et cetera. That's one of the really powerful things about an open license, and there's a lot of great material out there. Let's do jump to the next slide. And, and this is the slide where I say with my librarian hat on, I, I hope this slide is unnecessary. I, I hope everybody watching knows librarians are awesome. Uh, they're deeply involved and invested in open education as a thing. And the skill set that a librarian is trained in and brings overlaps in really profound and fundamental ways with the work of open education. Certainly the discovery piece is, is probably obvious and immediately leaps to mind, but if you know a librarian, you know somebody who thinks a little bit about course design, about copyright, about advocacy, about accessibility, etc. So um, if you're a librarian, I'm telling you things you know already. If you're an instructor, um, know that your librarians are thinking about this stuff, are excited about this stuff, and are the best partners you can possibly identify. So on the next slide, um, we wanted to take a minute or two just to highlight what some of these projects might look like in practice. We've seen some great examples already, um, but we wanted to give each of the presenters a chance to, to say a little something else about sort of what this process look like, looks like or what these projects might look like. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Anita and Amanda to talk a little bit more about the localization customization piece, about assessment, and then um, sort of some, some final thoughts. Great. So, um, so the next slide, please. And Amanda, please jump in as you like. Uh, so Fundamentals of Business was actually adapted from another book, another open textbook in 2016. Uh, then last year, I believe, uh, eCampus Ontario held a, an adaptation sprint and customized the book to be a Canadian edition. As you may know, Canada has uh, has significantly different politics, uh, government, economy, uh, use of the letter U. <laughs> um, so words like labor turn into L-A-B-O-U-R and um, uh, I'm told that this is the correct spelling, the, the Canadian spelling. Um, <laughs> so this book um, that was created by um, eCampus Ontario is um, a very deep remix of the fundamental fundamentals of business um, that we created at Virginia Tech. So we're, we were really excited when this came out um, and I think it's a great example. Amanda, do you want to add anything about uh, the Can Canadianization? Sure, yeah. So um, again, as mentioned, um, the spellings tend to be different. Um, and also, I think a lot of it ends up being kind of what are business cases or what are businesses that are um, much more localized or much more relevant within the, the area that you're in. So for example, for us, um, if we were to look at businesses that are generally much more British Columbia focused, we'd be looking at um, either fi uh, fishing, shipping, we'd be looking at tourism, um, and so those kind of things where we could talk about use business case studies that were a little bit more relevant to the work that's happening directly in our city. Cities. Thanks. Great. Thank you both. Uh, do we want to talk a little bit about assessment? 
Yeah, that would be great. Um, Amanda, I know you had a little bit of experience about this. Um, if you have the next slide. And then anyone else who'd worked on assessment, yeah. issues, that would be great. Yeah, so um, there's a couple things. Um, obviously, with the pivot to online that has been happening, there has been um, a lot of conversation about, well, what do we do about assessing? And what should our assessment strategies be, in particular in online um, as we look forward? So um, there are a few things. One is, of course, we've been looking at the opportunity for institutions to implement either a pass-fail strategy or to look at alternate forms of assessment. And we to talk about alternate forms of assessment, the ones that we've sort of been giving as um, examples have been things like case studies or essays, interviews or oral examinations, um, an open book exam, perhaps a paper or portfolio or reflective diaries, any form of a podcast, an infographic or a poster, a uh, questionnaire, video. Um, and so we do have some, um, and I can pass this on too. I have a really great, um, I have a really great uh, PDF here. It's quite long, but the title of it is Don't Panic, The Hitchhiker's Guide to Alternative Assessment. And what it does is it also breaks down into rubrics and kind of what you need to do, what would be your checklist and things like that. The area that we've been really finding an interesting, I was talking about this yesterday, is in our trades programs, for example. So what does practical assessment look like for trades programs? And um, while we haven't necessarily figured this out, I think it's really important to take note of. There are other, um, you know, trades programs, for example, like a heavy duty mechanic or um, aerospace mechanic that obviously won't be able to showcase any of their work directly involved. However, one of the things we also have been doing, I would say is related to assessment is um, putting up a large list and I can share this as well, it is about a 13 page document where we have, um, we have a series of virtual labs and the virtual labs are all open and they're available within the different subject areas for sciences. So I'd be happy to share that as well. Great, thank you. Um, so we just have a few minutes left. Um, I wanted to briefly come back to our earlier presenters, Anita and Aperva and Karen, if you could talk a little bit about um, funding and compensation models, both ones at your institution that you've seen, either direct funding or support for publishing services or course releases, anything like that. Karen, maybe would you be willing to start? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so at Portland State, our funding model has been, we've done a call for proposals um, and we have decided beforehand how much funding um, each of the projects will receive. All of our funding at Portland State is actually um, from our foundation, so it's all donor funding. We currently um, have been able to raise money through our um, alumni association as well as through outside donors. Um, and then we just have to follow university policy based on how we can uh, pay faculty for their labor. So for us, we pay all of our faculty in the summer. We unfortunately don't have enough money um, to be able to cover course buyout. Um, and then each of the faculty members actually creates their own budget. And that's part of the, my role as the program manager is to go through and verify that they're meeting their budgetary needs and that their budget is getting spent um, accurately and correctly. And then we also help faculty go and um, identify and find like reviewers, copy editors, designers, and that all gets, that all comes out of their budget as well. So we spend a lot of time uh, focused on the budget and we try to make sure that the faculty author isn't worrying about that, that instead it's, it's our job to worry. Thank you. Uh, Perva, would you like to speak to that? Sure, um, I'll just mention Rebus is a charity, so we haven't actually been in the position of being able to give grants to our um, creators, but we've actually seen these come in many different forms. So creation grants, like Karen was describing, or adoption grants, but also through professional development fellowships. So it doesn't necessarily have to come through um, a, a creation grant in particular. It can come through a fellowship from your state board of education. It can come from a fellowship from a larger organization um, that is investing in open education. So I would encourage folks to look outside the typical um, just your campus box for this kind of help. 
Thank you. Um, Anita, would you like to hop on for a second? Uh, we've had faculty that uh, obtain grants through a number of different sources, internal and external. We have some state level funds that are competitive uh, and um, had some people uh, be awarded those funds. Um, internally, the grants that we have are, uh, we have very difficult time paying faculty. Uh, that's really up to their department. So the funds that we transfer to their department are um, purposefully for project support. If the department decides we want to pay this person, that that does happen, but most often uh, departments, um, a lot of departments are, anyway, the library does not, is not able to directly pay people money in their pocket for this kind of work. So we have some constraints there. I do think it's really important to pay people because this is real work. Um, we have some people who've said, I don't need the money. Um, I've also said, please take the money because I need you to sign off on the, the terms of the agreement so that we know up front how this is gonna be licensed, who owns it, how it will be used, um, that it will be used, that it will be evaluated. And it's really a, an accountability check. Plus it's very helpful because we have a lot of, um, a lot of situations where we need to add alt text. Um, we need to write alternative text. We need to do something with the LaTeX to make sure that it's readable. And that's not free. It's not something that most faculty know how to do or have time to do. So we often um, encourage them to identify what are the things you don't have time to do, don't want to do, don't know how to do, or you want somebody else to do, and let's let's find a way for for you to spend money doing that sort of thing. Um, it can also go toward copy editors, toward graphic designers, um, other support people for the getting the work done. Great. Uh, thank you so much. I wanted to invite um, my colleague uh, Peter Yazi, a professor of law. Um, at American University to talk a little bit about some of the work that we're going to do going forward um, with the OER community about sort of understanding and implementing fair use. Peter, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Meredith. Earlier in, in the program, in a somewhat different context, Karen said what are for me the magic words, which are community of practice, because Something we've been doing at American University Law School over the really last 15 years is working with different communities of practice to try to help them understand how they can make use of and to articulate their own community standards for making use of the right of fair use that Meredith described to you so, so well earlier for reasons that Meredith also described, although there's a fair amount of general knowledge that there is such a thing as fair use, in, in many places, in many areas of practice, people feel a little uncertain. They lack a little confidence about how to mobilize this for their own purposes. And really this best practices in fair use project has been an attempt to, to meet that need by working to create community-based uh, guidance documents, not guidelines, not documents that say, oh, you can use 10% of this or two seconds of that. Or, or, all of that stuff is, is, is nonsense. All of that is, that's the urban folklore of copyright. But to help communities wor work through the question of, how you think about fair use, how you make robust and reliable fair use decisions, whatever your objectives may be. And of course, the objectives of a librarian are different from the objectives of a documentary filmmaker. And those in turn are different from the objectives of a working poet. Those are all communities of practice we've worked with before. So each needs its own localization, to borrow another good uh, OER catchphrase of this principle for its own activities. And we are at work 
on helping the OER community do the same. And we have a work plan which was going to take us a year and which we have decided can be compressed into a few months. And we will be, some of you will be hearing from us in, in the, in the near future and your, your participation and help will be solicited. And anyone in turn who is interested in or curious about the project can find out more, I think at the website, right, Meredith? Yes. Um, so that's a good, a good transition. This website here, auw.cl slash OER is the short link to both the information about this webinar series that's ongoing and also how to get involved in our best practices project. Um, Peter, do you have more? Should I lead into our next? No, I think that's where I think that's that's good to go out go out on. Uh, this has been listening to this discussion. It's been enormously inspiring, and it it you know it fills me with with further conviction that we both should and can get this done. Great. Well, so in the short term, um, we have webinars for the next three weeks on Friday, not in this time slot. Actually, at um, noon east coast 9 a.m pacific um the first one next week is taking a deep dive on issues of universal design and access for students with disabilities um focusing on what are the questions in the creation implementation of oer that we need to think through to make sure that all students have equitable access to these new materials that we're creating and that we're not inadvertently um, excluding students with disabilities from the full range of learning opportunities. The week after that, as I said before, we're going to focus on thinking through a sort of comparison of fair use to fair dealing and understanding why, in fact, the differences between fair use and fair dealing don't pose a significant barrier to cross-border projects in OER, because I think, you know, the projects at BC campus are so strong and so tied into projects in the US that fostering that continued uh, cooperation is really important. And then finally, in a webinar that's not up on the website yet, but we'll send out information shortly, on May 22nd, the third Friday, we're gonna be talking about um, culturally responsive teaching, uh, equality and anti-racism, and thinking through how, though OER can be a tool for more representative and more just educational practices that we really need to think about who the authors of OER are and who the students that they think about in their creation are and the ways in which if we're not careful in structuring our OER projects that we can end up repeating or even exacerbating sort of existing inequality in our educational system. So those are the next three coming up. Um, universal design, then uh, US Canada, then um, equality, and uh, diversity and justice in the educational system. So we hope you'll join us for those. I wanna um, thank my presenters very much. Um, and thank you all for taking an hour and 40 minutes out of your Friday. Have a great weekend. And thank you so much for all of your hard work um, supporting students. Have a great weekend. Sorry about the sirens, bye.